Let's stand for the reading of the word, Luke chapter 21. We're continuing on with uh, 1948. This will be the second session in the last. And um, some things, I saw some things a little clearer than I've seen in the past, and so I was very glad for that also. Luke 21, starting at verse 24. And they, this is Israel, the Jews, shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. We know that happened. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. That's been for thousands of years. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The Jews may be back in Israel, but Gentiles still have dominion. The Arabs still have a mosque and the holy place and the uh, influence of America on Israel is still too much. And uh, so it's not going right yet. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking into those things which are coming on the earth. They're seeing prophecy and scaring them. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. The power of heaven on earth is the church. The church has been shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your head, for your redemption draweth nigh. And he spake to them a parable. Behold a fig tree, that's always Israel, and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, you know, you see and know of your own selves that summer is nigh at hand. I've repeated it, but I want you to catch the symbolism here. There's been a long winter of dormancy. And now springtime has come for a nation, and she's budding forth. So likewise ye, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Lord Jesus, how we love that concept of your word because we believe we have attached to the word for our day. And Brother Branham was asked, how can I be part of the bride of Christ? He says, become one with the word. And that's exactly our desire. That's why we're here, Lord, to become one with the Word, for that's Christ. And so God, guide us this morning to see where we're failing. Doesn't do any good, Lord, for us to know where we're doing well or patting us on the back. That won't keep us out of glory. But where we're failing, that's where we want to know. So change us, correct us as we need be. Need be. In Jesus' name we ask it. And amen. You may be seated. Isaiah 5:26 on the screen, and he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far, and will hiss unto them from the ends of the earth, and behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. The ensign that they lifted up was the Star of David. And it says here it will be a sign for the nations, for all the nations to see what God has done. But sadly enough, most of the nations have left the sign unrecognized. They fail to see that it's God. So our subject matter is 1948. This is the year much scripture is tied to in the fulfillment of Israel. And remember the, the, thing, the a part about the verse, this generation shall not pass until all be fulfilled. So a generation in the Greek, it says fathered or birth or nativity, that would be the generation or that which has been begotten men of the same stock or family. That would be a generation out of the same lineage. And then this, the several ranks of natural descent, the successives members of a genealogy. That would be generation. And then a race of men very like each other in endowments, pursuits, characters, especially in the bad sense or the perverse sense. We always talk about that generation that came out of the name a year, 60s or whatever. And so it's that same sense. The whole multitude of men living at the same time. We are a generation of people. 
And so therefore the generation that's seed stock out of Israel will not pass away. But then if we want to apply it to us personally, then what about this generation? Will this generation that sees Israel become a nation, will it pass away? How many in here were alive to see Israel become a nation? Come on, there's more than you than that that's that old. All right, just not, not so many, I'm surprised. Uh, it's more than not as many as I thought. So I mentioned it last time, the World War generation is all but gone. The World War II generation, I'm part of that. There's a few of us who are still part of that. Immediately after World War II came 1948 and the Balfour Treaty came into uh, process to give Israel back her home, homeland. And so here we are now in that, in that era. And then this, so now when we, when we look at a, we closed last time, if you may recall, we closed last time speaking of a road map. And so you look at that map and it is absolutely useless to you. You say, here's a map. Great. What is it of and where am I? That's always the first question anybody asks. You go into a shopping mall and you look, look on a mall map, you know, and the first thing you want to know is find the little you are here sign. And then you can go from there. So until you find out where you are, it's very difficult to go on, to go on from there. Daniel 12.4 says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Now, of course, we know the book has been unsealed. And then it says, Many shall run to and fro, and then and then knowledge shall be increased. Men shall run to and fro. We're doing it like no other age could have ever done. And knowledge shall increase. I told you last time, I think it was, they estimate that 98% of all inventions that have ever been invented since the time of Adam have taken place in the last 150 years. So knowledge shall increase, knowledge shall increase. So it's escalating so fast that it's just almost unbelievable unbelievable what's, what's happening. So before we go back to world events, I want to bring it first a little bit closer to home, then we'll get back to world events again. So the, the primary roadmap that we would want to discuss, of course, is first of all, a roadmap is useless unless you know where you are and where you're going. So the, the here am I right there, but then where I want to go is right over there. And so now I, the map can make some sense to me. I see that there's actually a main road that can take me all the way over there. So now the thing is being deciphered, deciphered to me. So consequently, as we, as we take that principle now, the year of the restoration of Israel, scripturally the mark that the grace to the Gentiles is about to end. First, how should we respond to this? How do you feel about that? I want you to look innermost to think that this might be the final generation on earth, that this might very well be the culmination of the whole thing. Brother Branham saw America by vision and nothing but chaos, ruin, and debris. How does that strike you? As an American, yeah, we have our feelings, but I mean personally as your walk. Can you see this as the most glorious golden age to see the wind-up of the whole plan of God? Or is it fearful, oh my, look what's coming? You need to know, where am I? If the time comes where the scripture is fulfilled that says, let him that is filthy be filthy still, let him that is righteous be righteous still, where would you be trapped? What if God pushed that button and says, this is your condition for eternity? He's going to do that one day. One day that will happen. And your soul condition, your attitude toward God, your life of consecration or lack of consecration, you will be trapped right there. There will be no movement. So ask yourself, am I ready, willing to be caught for eternity in my present condition? Where am I? Where am I going? Where am I, spiritually speaking? The message gives us the guidelines. 
There's always a way to start to correct yourself if you're in error. First of all, he says, read your Bible and pray every day. God sends a message to each age to accomplish his goal for the age. So if we're, if we're feeding on the, the gospel of another age, it won't produce what God wants produced in this age. God sends his word to accomplish what he wants for that age. And so therefore, that's, that is the error of denominational system. They preach a message that was effective to accomplish what God wanted accomplished in some previous age. And then God moves on with a new message to bring the church higher, to bring her close to rapturing grace, rapturing faith. And then the denomination holds to what their founder had and speaks of themselves gloriously about historically what they were. <clears throat> that makes no account. God is the I am. What he was, we learn from. What he will be, we look forward to, but we must meet the I am. What is God doing today? Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. So where am I? Am I feeding on a word that will prepare me for a body change? Am I feeding on a word that will cause me to meet the Lord in the air? Or am I feeding on a word that's going to give me the gifts of the Spirit? Nothing wrong with that. Going to give me salvation? Nothing wrong with that. Going to clean up my life? Nothing wrong with that. That's all in the plan of God. Every part of it's in the plan of God. But the ultimate goal, declaring, bringing, rapturing grace, rapturing faith to the bride of Christ in this age. Listen to those tapes. Here's a few simple instructions. We all start here. Repent and water baptism. What do we always say is next after repentance and water baptism? You always hear it over this pulpit. Anybody can think of the next words? What do we always say next? Feed your experience. The Holy Ghost only feeds on the Word. Only. Nothing else. It won't feed on anything but the Word of God. And then separate yourself from your worldly connections and worldly activities. They do not help you in your spiritual growth. And so without the separated life, <clears throat> you will be hindered. That doesn't mean you have to quit your job because they play the wrong music. The scripture says we're in the world, but not of it. You can't help it. You're going to be, you'd have to, Bible even says you'd have to leave earth to get away from worldly things. But still in, in, your, in your associations, in your fellowship, what are you fellowshipping around? The Word of God and the, and the people that believe the Word of God or other things. Approximately 100 times we are told in the message that we have a post of duty. In Forsaking All, I thought that's an ideal title for this one. It says, when the church is open, every soldier ought to be in his rank and in his place. And if you think about it just a minute, about half of this congregation is not here on Wednesday nights. Lay aside everything, every sin, quoting the prophet, that does so easily beset, that does so easily beset you, Brother Branham, I don't do nothing. That sin that easily besets you, Brother Branham, I don't do nothing. Maybe that's what's the matter. That's the trouble of it. It's more sin not to do than it is to do when you know better. That's right. He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. You've got to make ready. Doing nothing is the worst thing you can do doing nothing about it. You Southerners remember your history? When up here, when Grant was sitting just across the river, and he had a boy out there on guard duty, and the rebels was across the river, and this boy was walking along there, kind of dazed around in the, in the dreams of his sweetheart. He left his post of duty and went down to pick some violets to send to his sweetheart. He didn't mean to do wrong. He just, he went. Then at that time, there was a spy ready from the Southern Army, and they slipped in, and they looked around, and they found out that the Southern Army was two or three times the size of, of General Grant's. Well, what happened? The boy came back to his post of duty not knowing what had happened, but the spy had already been there, and what happened? They stormed across the river and drove them plumb back up into the state. And that boy was shot an hour later, not because... They didn't have any objection to him picking violets. Didn't have, it wasn't what he had done. It was the things he didn't do. He didn't stand to his post of duty. 
He didn't guard the post like he was supposed to, and he spoiled the whole thing. And that responsibility tonight lays at Life Tabernacle, that's where he was preaching, at other tabernacles and the churches in Shreveport. God is here taking with a storm. It ain't what you're doing, then it is what you're failing to do. Remember, as in the days of Noah, they ate, they drank, they built it, they gave it, and they built it, and they married, and they did it. No sin. No sin. They were caught up in the cares of life. It wasn't what they were doing. It's what they were not doing. They were not seeking God. Let's do something about it. Let's dig with all of our hearts. He was talking about digging a valley full of ditches. That when the day of judgment comes, we can say, God, I did the very best I could, and you know I did. Amen. And when, when we know what we can do, that's all that's expected. When we know what we can do, that's all expected. Post of duty. I think every person ought to be at your post of duty when your church is open. That's correctly. That's exactly. You should stand by your pastor and stand by your board and stand by your church. These are all quotes from the message. And I'm afraid that it's going to be, he's making a comparison here of Pearl Harbor and how we were caught off guard. I'm afraid it's going to be likewise at the coming of the Lord. The church is so took up and drunken with the cares of this world till they're going to be asleep at the post of duty at the coming of the Lord. Hebrews 10, 19. Watch this sequence now. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So first think about that. Is that your attitude? Or when you kneel in prayer, are you thinking, man, I did it again. How can I go before God? I did that thing again. I made a mistake again. I, and your sins condemn you. God tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as it says here, boldness to enter in by, to the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. When you kneel to pray, it is not your righteousness, your holiness that, that allows you in, neither is it your mistakes that keep you out. It's whether or not you can receive what the blood has done for you. Therein is your righteousness. By a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. God was behind the veil in the old tabernacle. God was behind the veil in Jesus Christ. And do we recognize who was behind the veil? It was God that did what was done for us. And having a high priest over the house of God, the scripture had continued to say, we have a high priest who's been in flesh. He knows what it is to be tempted. He knows what it is that we go through. So he understands. So when we talk to our high priest, he knows what our life is like. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Continuing on, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. You remember the profession of your faith. Say what the word says. Profess to say the same thing as. Say what the word says. Don't testify to your shortcomings. Testify to his righteousness, which has been imputed to you if you are a believer. And let us consider one another to provoke one another unto good works. Don't hesitate to probe and prod one another. And don't be upset or hurt if somebody's pushing you a little bit. They ask you, uh, are you sure that's such a good thing or good thought or good thing to talk about? They're just doing the scripture. They're playing their role in scripture to be God's advocate. Very next scripture, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I think that's important. That's part of the same instructions that says repent and be baptized. The same instruction says don't forsake to assemble. Same instruction. Notice what the very next verse is. For if we sin willfully 
After that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. I'm going to let that just linger on your heart just as it is. I'm not going to explain it this time. If you misunderstand it, it's okay this time. I'm just going to let it linger right there. But a certain fearful looking for of the judgment and the fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. So consequently, God has brought us to a place where he's telling us the word has been sent forth to accomplish something in this age and the word has given us the instructions. If we fail to make it, it's because we fail to listen to the instructions. We let something else come higher in our life, a higher precedent than that. <clears throat> now back to world events. The next scriptural event in the Bible is the rapture, but of course, how close are we? Just after the rapture, the Antichrist will come into full power. And we know the laws of mechanics and dynamics. When a car is going through the assembly line at the Honda plant, all the mechanics are being set in order. And when it reaches the end of the line, it's just a big hunk of material. You can get in it, you can smell a new upholstery, you can admire the way it looks, but it can't take you one place until they put one more ingredient called, get two more, gas and oil into all the mechanics. They got to put these two things in there. And then of course within the mechanics is, is this little gadget that'll create a spark on the gas. But without the gas, without the oil, all the mechanics are useless. But nevertheless, it has to go through the mechanics before the mechanics are ready for the dynamics. So if the Antichrist is about soon to come in power, then we should see the mechanics being set in order. Now the last time we went through this, we went through all of these quite quickly to show you that they are absolutely set in order. And so therefore this, this Antichrist power is going to be in control of a world religion, a world monetary system, and a world government. And we've watched everything falling right into place for all three of them to be exactly in place. So the first, the mechanics. So the final, everything, the, the dynamics to this setting in place, of course, will be that the Antichrist will step on the throne. The Antichrist will be Satan incarnate in a man. And we know who that man is. He'll be Satan incarnate in a man. When the bride of Christ goes up, Revelations chapter 10. In Revelations chapter 12, we find, we find Satan being cast to the earth. A spirit is virtually useless, helpless, without a, without a body to work through. So when Satan is cast to the earth, I'll just go ahead and say it. He will incarnate whoever is in the office of Pope at that time. And the false prophet will become the Antichrist. Right now, he's a false prophet because he's preaching a false doctrine. But that's all he is. But one day he will become the Antichrist incarnate. I don't know which, whether it be this one or some other one. That I have no idea. So Europe rising to power. So the, the European economic community that is now going up in the United Nations are all setting in place a governmental, governmental power. And so as we look at this, this becomes significant. Brother Branham said when the Berlin Wall comes down, and that was in November of 89, the Berlin Wall did come down, but before that he says when it comes down, it, it will set in order the old Roman Empire politically in its parameters. So here's Europe as it is today, and here's the old Roman Empire. To get, that, get a visual on that now, there's the old Roman Empire, and then here's back to Europe as it is today. So you see the outline is there. If I, were, if I had a drawing instrument that I could do it on the screen, we would, we would split Germany right down the middle through Berlin over there, and then all those communist nations were separated off over there into a different entity. But once the Berlin Wall came down, the com communist powers fell down, and then the parameters, the outside of the old, Berlin, or old Roman Empire uh, dimensions, excuse me, are there again. What does that mean to us? The mechanics are in order. So therefore, if the parameters are, are, are there, that means we're in the season. 
in the season when the, when the dynamics are going to come onto the mechanics. The whole thing is set, set in order. So we recall from the scripture that this Antichrist, he's also called the man of sin, will have world power. So here comes our predicted union of churches. It's, it's in the scripture, but we've seen these scriptures, but maybe you haven't thought of it in the context of which we're talking now. The, through the UN and the European Economic Community and our Democratic Party, which is trying desperately to get America to submit to the rules and regulations of the United Nations. The Republicans are holding against it. The Democrats want to just submit. If you listen very much, they, they talk about global village and, and uh, unilateral operations. What they mean is, is, excuse me, multilateral operations. Unilateral means America makes the decisions by herself. And the, the, some of the politicians are against that. They, they want a more inclusive thing, which means listen and do what the United Nations tells us to do. And then they fuss about these people making a unilateral one-way decision. America has no right in this great developing global community to make decisions on our own. I think we ought to make decisions on our own. That's my opinion. But anyway, in the, on the church situation, Matthew 13.30 tells you, let both grow together, this is wheat and tares, until the harvest, we're in harvest season, and in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles. So the tares, just look at it, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, go back to Matthew 13. There'll be some of you who are not familiar with that parable. Matthew 13, open your Bible there please. The points that are pointed out here, again, point, point and tell us where we are in time, that we are at, at the end time. The parable starts at Matthew 13, 24. Matthew 13, 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sows good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So now notice... The entire growing season, nobody talked about wheat and tares. But when the fruit began to come forth, it became obvious, hey, the tares are showing up. Where did they come from? Now, for those of you that are good students now, think back to the opening of the seals in Revelations chapter 6. The white horse, red horse, black horse rider it all talked about what he did, but did not tell us who the rider was. But when the eagle came, lion, ox, man, eagle were the, three, the four anointings explaining what the white, red, black, and pale horse would do. When the pale horse was, was there, the, it was the eagle that said, I'll tell you who he is, he's death. The other says he's on a white horse and he's doing this. He's on a red horse and he's doing this. Now he's on a black horse and he's doing this. But it didn't say who he was. But the eagle said he's death. At the end, the tares appear also. So you see on both these now it's telling us where we are. Okay. Verse 27, so the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then has it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. And the servant said unto them, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? He said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you rid up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles. That is the World Council of Churches. It is gathering those churches who have not and will not go on with the word. Organized religion that stays in what some founder taught up to years ago or has completely dismissed the Bible anyway and has a totally political aim. So that's that world council, some kind of ecumenical move that's gathering the tear churches to burn them. But gather the wheat into the barn. The gathering of the wheat into the barn takes place between the gathering of the tares, which is going on now, and the burn them, which is in the tribulation, and then and the gathering of the wheat takes place right in between those two. And that's where we are. 
the message of the hour. Remember that the Lord himself descends from heaven with a shout, a voice, and a trump. And the shout is the message of the hour to gather the elect back to the word of God to get them ready for a rapture. So the gathering is going on right now. That's why we are so enthused about, about a missionary work and trying to reach out because we want to reach out and do our part of gathering the elect back to the word, fulfilling that word, gather the wheat into my barn, bring them back to the word. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> now let's go on. They, 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 uh, apostles didn't quite understand the parable. So in verse 36, then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into his house and his disciples came unto him, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said unto them, he that sows the good seed is the son of man. That happened in the beginning with the ministry of Jesus Christ. When the revealing of the son of man came, he sowed again. You remember in Malachi 4, it says, remember the law of Moses. What are we supposed to remember the law of Moses for? Because God gave it to him, then he had to give it to him again. So God gave us the word to the apostle Paul. We got away from it and God gave it to us again. So therefore, we, the very same principle is following. He that sows his the good seed is the son of man. And the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Remember, the scripture says that Cain was of that wicked one, that evil one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels, messengers, God messengers. And therefore the tares are gathered and burned into the fire. So shall it be at the end of the world. The son of man shall send his forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There should be wailing and gnashing of teeth and then the righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who has ears to hear, let him hear. Where are we on the road map? We are in the process of gathering the wheat to the barn. The next thing is burning. All the other mechanics are there gathering the tear churches all together. But God's got to get his bride ready, gather the wheat, take them into the barn. Where are we? Right on top of the end. Amen. 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 Revelations 13, 11. I told you I've been listening to another Bible expositor on uh, prophecy. I won't mention his name this time. I mentioned it last time, but because it's going to be negative this time, I won't mention his name. And he takes Revelations 13, 11 and says, I beheld another beast coming out of, out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb. So he says, whatever this is, he said, it has something to do with being an imitation Christ because a lamb is mentioned. And he says, it looks like. Well, it's not that at all. Not that at all. Let's read it again. And I behold another beast that represents a power. A beast is a power. Coming up out of the earth is contrary to the first beast in, in verse 1 that came up out of the sea, multitudes of people. This comes up out of, out of the earth, which is not so populated land because it's America. And he had two horns like a lamb. Two horns. A horn is, is an animal's defense or power. And so this is government power, civil power on one side, and ecclesiastical or religious power on the other side. So civil and ecclesiastical power are the two horns. And if you go back to the founding of our nation, what do we point to? Our government, our constitution, and they were Christians. And so we've got that civil and ecclesiastical starting right there at the beginning. Of course, now there's conflict over that, but nevertheless, that was the beginning. And you notice it doesn't say like a ram. It says like a lamb. Why? Because it's a young nation. It never gets old. It doesn't become a ram. It's a young nation. A 200-year-old nation is a young nation. I've told you when I was over in Pickering, England, Jeff and I were over there ministering. We were walking down the street and there was a Built old building there with a building block in the corner with the date carved on it, and the building was there before Christ. And here we are, 200 years old. <clears throat> and he spake as a dragon. So therefore, it starts out in a lamb-like nature, civil and ecclesiastical power, and then comes on over and speaks like the dragon. The dragon, of course, is Satan. The dragon is Rome. Are we together? And so now here's this nation that's going to move in that direction. 
And the first beast in Revelation chapter 13 is the, shows the dying of, of pagan Rome, wounded to death, and the resurrection as papal Rome. And so that's the first beast, papal Rome. And then the second beast is America. Now notice all the Bible expositors say America is nowhere described in the Bible. But a prophet came along and said, there she is. And he says, look at, look at the similarity. He says that she's in chapter 13. And she started out with 13 colonies and a, and a flag with 13 stripes. And the original flag, 13 stars and 13 stripes. You go on to the American dollar bill and the, and the shield of the eagle has 13 stripes. And the, uh, the eagle is holding spears in one hand, 13 of them and holding grains of wheat in the other, and between the buds there's 13, and the staffs of wheat there's, there's uh, 13. And so it's just 13, 13, 13. When you look at the pyramid that is there with the all-seeing eye on the top, there's 13 steps in the pyramid. Everything is 13, 13, 13. We look at the Latin across the top of the letter, uh, talked about, I uh, can't even remember what it means now, but across the there, and there's 13 letters, 13 letters in the Latin. Everything is 13, 13, 13. Why God trying to flag to us who we are and where we are? And a prophet comes along and says, there you are in the dollar bill, and here you are in Scripture. 13, 13. Amen. Now notice this, this lamb speaking like a dragon, verse 12. Now remember now, this is coming out of America, what we're talking about. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. That's the Roman church. What was the power of the first beast? Brought on the dark ages, 68 million Protestants put to death under the power of the Roman church during the dark ages. And he's going to exercise all the power, not part, all the power of the first beast before him and cause, and cause the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. America, through her Protestant weakness, pulpits that won't preach the word of God, is going to take the Protestant churches and turn them back to Romanism again. Doesn't mean that they're going to, doesn't mean they're going to uh, start worshiping Mary. Doesn't mean that at all. All they have to do is unite. And you can see it happening right now. And what is their grounds of union? Morality. Mac Catholic Church, we're against abortion. Protestants, we're against abortion. Let's work together on this. And morality, we're against homosexuality, the Catholic Church says but doesn't practice. And then the Protestant church says, we're against homosexuality. And yeah, let's unite on this. So what are they uniting on? That very grounds. It appeared they were going to unite to fight communism. And that may happen because communism will rise again. So now, catch the, catch the implications. This power will rise in America. A world council of churches. A council of churches. Whatever name it's going to be carried under, I don't know. And I think 371, if I remember the number correctly now, of the, of the denominations of America have all joined into this Council of Churches. And, and if you go to their website, this year they are, they are celebrating 40 years in cooperation with the Church of Rome. Celebrating. Exactly what it says here. And then here we've been a Protestant nation initiated originally to flee the Roman Catholic Church. And then all over the news is our last three presidents all kneeling before the casket of the Pope. What's happening? It's giving Catholicism a good look. Well, you know, must be okay. Look, there's all the presidents of America. Because America, she kind of leads what's happening in the world. Where's the handwriting? It's on the wall. It's on the wall. Read it. <clears throat> so here comes our one world religion. So we've, saw, we've seen the one world finance, uh, excuse me, government. We've seen the one world religion. It's all right there in Scripture. And we can see we're right at the climax of the whole thing. Right at it. And then the money situation, of course, for the world, that's been under control of a world bank since the early 1900s. Here in America, the so-called Federal Reserve that watches over our money is not federal at all. It's a private banking system, but they gave it the name to deceive the American public that it sounds like it's part of the government. It is not. Psalm 
science, science, where are we? And he exercises all the power of the beast before him. Where are we in time? Reading, behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem, Zechariah 12.2. Just think about what an obvious sign that is. One little speck on the map and the whole world's trying to tell them how to run themselves. We get a little problem in Waco, Texas and go out and just obliterate a little bit of group. We have a couple people who are claimed to be storing ammunition and weapons up in the mountains of Montana and they go in and, and sh shoot the wife and, and capture the husband. I mean, talk about, and then, tell, and then tell Israel, make peace with the Palestinians. How can you make peace with a people whose Bible, the Koran, tells them to drive every Jew into the sea. Don't we recognize, our government can't seem to recognize there will be no peace between those two groups. There will be no peace. No matter what the Israelites give up to the Palestinians, they won't be happy. They don't want even any Jews existing, much less the land of Israel. So it's just not going to happen. So Zechariah 12.2. Jehovah speaks of Israel in the next verse. And in that day I will make Jerusalem a burden stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment, his rider with madness. I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. So now we're in that in between. See, here we are again, right at the end. God hasn't done this uh, equivalent of opening his eyes on Israel. He hasn't done that yet. But yet we see every nation burdening themselves with Jerusalem. So God says, now the next thing I've got to do is, is fulfill my word on those nations who keep bothering themselves with Jerusalem. Jerusalem belongs to the Jews. Jerusalem will be the place of the holy temple. It doesn't belong to any other people and it won't belong to any other people. But people keep trying to tell them, give this away and give that away. The very same thing that unbelieving friends and neighbors and other churches will try to get you to do with the Word of God. Just give up a little over here. Just give up a little over there. Well, why don't you just change this doctrine a little bit? It won't work. If you give up a little, then they're right back wanting you to give up more. And if you give up that, they're right back wanting you to give up more until you're in the same muck that they are. And that's what Palestinians are doing to the Jews. Very same thing. The natural is manifesting to us what's going on in spiritual right among us. Oh, now you believers, don't, don't be fanatical, you know, don't be so strong on the Word of God. I want to be a fanatic. I don't want to make myself odd, but if, if, if standing with the Word makes me a fanatic, then let me be a fanatic. So now the, the whole world is focusing on Israel. And God says, the Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he has sworn to your fathers. Here's a little strip of land on the Mediterranean Sea called Israel. And I don't even know how to compare it in size. I should have looked it up sometime, but I never have. So this land of Israel, when we look at it, here's the Arab nations that surround Israel. And look close, there's Israel. Little bitty dot. Now turn that to the spiritual. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way, few there be that find it into eternal life. Surrounded by organized religion that would take away from you everything you've got. But will Israel fall? She will not. 
Will the bride fall? She will not. Ezekiel 38. Now, for those of you who are Bible students but haven't heard this teaching in the past, Ezekiel 38 speaks of the battle of Gog and Magog. And everybody knows, if they're a Bible student at all, knows about the battle of Gog and Magog in the book of Revelation that is at the end of the millennium, at the general resurrection. That's the battle of Gog and Magog. But there is another battle of Gog and Magog this side of the millennium, and that's in Ezekiel 38. If you would turn to that, please. Verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, and the chief prince of Meshach and Tobul, and prophesy against him. And I say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tobul. Now, O Gog, is the, he's the ruler in Russia. And I will turn thee back. Notice, I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them with swords, and then he starts naming them. Now, he's going to bring them against the land of Israel. And if we were doing a, doing a study here, we would go down where it says that God says, and I will glorify myself in thee when one-sixth of your army returns home and five-sixths of your army dies in the valleys of Israel. God says that, I'm going to do that. And you're going to know that I'm God and the God of Israel when I do that. So God's going to bring him down. Now remember, Brother Branham said, Russia will go for the oil. You remember that? It seems to tie with this. He says, Russia will go for the oil. And he says, and there'll come a persecution on the church. Brother Branham was asked, Brother Branham, when will the battle of Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38 come to pass? Will it be in the tribulation? He says, I don't know. But he says it will be close there somewhere. So I don't know either. But it appears to me, because Brother Branham said, Russia will go for the oil, and then there will come a persecution on the church, that we may see the beginnings of this. The beginnings. Okay. Are we together now? Okay. <clears throat> now it says, and all them with thee, and then it says, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarma, and of the north quarters and all his bands and many people with thee. So here's all this group that it's naming that is going to come down against Israel. And you can't read it probably on the board. I can't read it from here, but I'll, let's go down now. We just, in Ezekiel 38, verse 5 and 6 that we just read, we find out that these nations that are listed now below there, it says... Persia, the name was changed in 1935 to Iran. It's 90% Muslim. Ethiopia is 40% to 50% Muslim and 35 to 40% Orthodox. That means one of the branches of Catholicism. Libya is 97% Sunni Muslim. Gomer became the Sumerians and they're around the Black Sea in the southern part of Russia. Part of them went up and became the Celtics uh, out of the U U U UK, as close as we can see. So around the Black Sea area and the south part of Russia is the Gomer. And then Togarma, that's the Turks. And then 38 verse 5, it mentions Sheba, and that's debated whether, it's, whether it is Ethiopia or Yemen. But for the point at hand, it doesn't make any difference. And then Dedan, which it mentions further on down, that's the northwest coast of the Persian Gulf. It's in Saudi Arabia. And Tarshish, the ships of Tarshish, say that that's North Africa near Tunis. Now, every one of those, except maybe Gomer, is absolutely Muslim. So Russia will come down against Israel assisted by Muslim nations. How can that be? Remember mechanics and dynamics. If you've watched the politics of the Middle East, America has pumped money and munitions into Israel. 
Russia has pumped munitions into the Muslim nations. So you already see the division of the union of the two. And so now mechanics, dynamics. This is the dynamics I'm talking about when they're, when they're used to come against Israel. But we see it all setting in order already. Now if everything we've looked at is being so perfectly set in order, world government, world church, world monetary systems, Russia and her allies to come down against Israel, then where should we be? Where should I be, ask yourself? You should be resting assured, I'm ready. I'm ready. If you don't have that assurance, this is the time you better get ready. Our day will close nearby very soon. So there's another map. The dark green is heavily Muslim. The light green is somewhat Muslim. And if you can envision there where Spain comes down and over across on the right-hand side of the Mediterranean Sea, a little bitty dot of a nation called Israel, surrounded by Muslim nations. Israel, totally surrounded by those who desire to drive all Jews into the sea. You can't even hardly see it on the map. Right there on the uh, eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea, you can see a little white spot, and that's the Dead Sea, which is about the only thing you can see glowing there in the land of Israel. Now, to show you, I'm, I'm diverting just a little bit. Remember now, the generation that sees Israel will not pass away. Now, just to show you God's prophecy. I won't take the time to read them to you because we're running out of time. But in, there are many prophecies concerning Edom or Edomia or uh, Mount Seir or Petra. They're all the same area. It's the, the descendants of Esau and it's called they call it Edom because Esau was the one that ate the pottage, the red pottage. Hadam means red, and it was shortened to Edom for the whole area where the children of Esau were. And then the other, other areas that we're going to talk about were, were the descendants of Lot out of his, out of his two daughters. And so the, all these scriptures uh, I'll just speak them, and if somebody wants to get it off the tape and read them, Isaiah 34, 5 and 6, Jeremiah 49, 7 to 18, Ezekiel 25, 12 to 13, and 35, 1 to 15, and Joel 3 to 19, and uh, 3, 19, excuse me, and Amos 1, 11, and Obadiah has a place, <coughs> and Malachi uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Well, let's just read that one. You're all familiar with Malachi. That's the last book in the Old Testament. We'll just read that one. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they, they shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord has indignation forever. And all these scriptures are all saying the same thing. I'm going to make this whole territory nothing but desolation. And on the map, if you can envision it, we've got, we've got Israel and then we've got the Dead Sea. And on the eastern side of the Dead Sea is a mountain range. And down that mountain range and down below the Dead Sea and sweeping across into the lower part of Israel, close to Gaza, into the lower part of Israel, all that is the land of, of the uh, Edomites 
and the, uh, all these others that are descendants and the Moabites and all, all those that are, that are in there. And God has spoken to all of them and says, I will make your area desolate, absolutely desolate. It was not at that time. Does that look desolate to you? Does that look desolate to you? You can't recognize it hardly from, from what you're seeing here, but this is the remains of what was a, an outdoor theater, enormous outdoor theater. And the mountain is carved for seating, and then there are pillars all up in front where the actors and drama all took place in between the pillars. But now what is it? Nothing but desolation. God said, I'll make it desolate. And then this is in Petra. And this, this used to be a place where kings and judges and monarchs would come and gather here to make decisions of how to control the whole area. It's nothing now but desolate. It's carved out of the sides of the rock. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. God says, I will make it a desolation and no man shall live there. However, tourists do come to Petra, and if you look close now, down here, whoosh, that's a postcard rack. <laughs> so tourists do, do come, do come to the area, but nobody lives, well, not, there are some, some that live there, not very much though. <clears throat> I'll read to you, when Russia comes down against Israel, remember we read it in Ezekiel 38, for the battle of Gog and Magog, which is this side of the millennium, Daniel 11.41 speaks of the very same thing. Turn, turn with me to Daniel. I'll give you just a little bit of understanding there that may help you in your Bible studies sometime when you're going through this. We won't study it out, but we'll just take a look at it. <clears throat> in Daniel 11, if you've got a Schofield Bible, right under chapter 11, it says, from Darius to the man of sin. And so all this first part of chapter 11, all the way over to verse 35, has all been fulfilled. And, and so if you've got a Schofield Bible, it'll tell you what king did this and what nation did that and what king did this and exactly, exactly how it was fulfilled. And then between verse 35 and 36, catch this now, between verse 35 and 36, is like a parenthesis, and it's, it, God is dealing with us Gentiles, and we've got our seven church ages. And then we pick up at verse 36 again, and God is now turning his attention back toward Israel. Not permanently there yet, but turning back toward Israel, right where we are now. Verse 36, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. We know that in Thessalonians, it tells us that he will sit in the temple as God, making himself God. And then, and shall prosper till the time of indignation be accomplished. That's the, the uh, tribulation. For that that is determined shall be done. Now listen, it's going to speak of the king. Watch this now. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. So to me, that's testifying it's going to be apostate Christianity. And based on what I understand, it will be exalting Mary to Godship and worship more than the God of his fathers, which was Jesus. Nor shall he have the desire of women he'll live a celibate life. In fact, their church preaches celibacy. Nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. I looked and looked and looked, trying to see if I could find the meaning of that. And it just sounds like he's honoring the God of nature. I don't quite understand that, but that's what it looks like. And the God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant, pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall call, cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. And at that time, well, we can go on. But anyway, 
Everything is setting in order for this very thing to happen. The Antichrist hasn't stepped on the, stepped on the throne yet. Verse 41, verse 41. Now here's our controversy again, Daniel 11, 41. He shall enter also into the glorious land, that would be Israel, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the children of Ammon. Now that's Lot's kids. And so right at the very last, when, when their land has been destroyed, their whole area has been made desolate, and yet when this final, final, final destruction comes, God has a little mercy on Lot's kids. All just east of the Jordan River and in the south of Israel. Are we at the end? You bet, we're at the end. My next slides go in to show us, well, I'll, I'll go through them very fast and you'll just see again where we are. Our Gentile age again. The seventh star in the right hand of Jesus, Revelations 1, 20, second half. The last or seventh church age, we're in it. Revelations 3, 14, under the angel of the church of the Laodicea, and that's the final age, that's our age. And then in Revelations 10, 7, that, so that seventh angel of 3, 14, but on the days of the voice of the seventh angel, mystery of God should be finished. It's happened. It's not prophecy, it's happened. And then, so we look at how far we've come. AD 33, we had the Book of Acts Church. AD 54, Ephesus. AD 170, Smyrna. AD 312, Pergamos. AD 606, started Thyatira. AD 1520, started Stardust. Uh, AD 1750, started the Philadelphian Age. 1906, started the Laodicean Age. Since 1906, which was the Azusa Street Revival, Brother Branham's ministry was launched in 1947. Israel became a nation after 2,000 years in 48. 1956, at the 50-year jubilee, America rejected the gospel. You shall uh, know the truth. The truth shall make you free. 1963, the opening of the seven seals. That's uh, the mystery of God made manifest. 1964, judgments began in the earth with the Alaska earthquake. <clears throat> then we had the Twin Towers. Then Hurricane Andrew, Katrina, Rita. And then next year is jubilee again. 2006, what's gonna happen? I don't know, but something will. God doesn't let these dates just pass through with nothing happening. Where are you on God's great map? Let's pray. Jeff and musicians, you can come on up. Heavenly Father, if one is not ready, it's a shaking time. For those who are ready, it's just God, bring it on. We love to see you fulfill your scripture for you are God. Governments, powers, United Nations, World Council of Churches, none have the strength of prophecy. Prophecy will come to pass. And God, we rejoice in that for that same God that has declared what would happen to Edom and it did and all the nations and it did and then the things that are happening and we see them and the same God has declared through a prophet but the bride she will not fall we're resting on that Lord the word that started the work will finish the work oh God where we're failing you flash it to us Lord Flashing red lights of his coming are all around us, but where are we on the roadmap? May we each one find that place and find our direction to point directly to the place we want to go. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.